So welcome everyone. Um, it, it's the first time I've taught in this blended lecture theatre and we've got an excellent uh, attendance in person here at Manchester but also I gather quite a significant attendance online from academics around the UK, not just Royce Partners, but I saw people registered from Warwick, from Queen's University, Belfast, from Huddersfield, but also other Royce Partners and others with an interest um, in this area. Um, what I'm going to do today is uh, introduce myself, my role at the University of Manchester and the Royce, I'm going to explain why this workshop's taking place, um, and then I'll do a short introduction to parliamentary process and select committees. Um, I'm going to spend a fair chunk of time, about 20 minutes on case studies, for how I can best engage as an expert. I want to leave some time for your questions and answers, and if you do have any questions uh, and you're on Zoom, uh, please just type them in and Luke will be monitoring those two. Um, and then we'll spend a few minutes on next steps. Right, so, right. so hopefully people can hear me now and uh, we need to turn the video on. Do we need to turn the no, video on? Okay You're okay, yeah. right. We're recording it two different ways, so uh, hopefully, well, welcome to people on, online as well. Um, so I'm going to go on to the next slide now. Uh, my background was after a degree and PhD in materials um, at Cambridge, I joined ICI, which then became Zeneca and AstraZeneca, and worked for 20 years in the chemical and pharmaceutical industry in a variety of technical and then regulatory roles. In 2008, uh, in September 2008, just as the Great Recession was starting, I joined the British Ceramic Confederation, the Trade Association for UK Ceramic Manufacturers. Um, so that's an, it was uh, pre-COVID, an industry of two billion turnover a year and employing 20,000 people. Um, I retired from that earlier this um, year. Um, after uh, 13 and a half years as chief exec. And um, I became in September 2020 a Royal Academy of Engineering visiting professor at Manchester University Department of Materials and also at the Henry Royce Institute. Um, so this gave me the ability to work across all these fantastic um, Royce partner universities as well. Um, as the chief exec of uh, BCC, um, as, as well, we, it, it was about a trade association represents member companies. It's about working on policy areas in particular that cut across all different sorts of manufacturers. So from ceramics that make anything from construction materials to technical ceramics and refractories and tableware. It was about uh, focusing very much on energy, net zero, uh, health and safety, uh, minerals extraction, environmental issues, Brexit and trade and COVID. And in addition, I was running a small business. So uh, my role at Manchester and the Royce, uh, for those of you who've um, heard of the Royal Academy of Engineering Scheme, it's about, uh, of visiting professors, it's about using the experience with our background as a non-academic to enhance the teaching and learning, as well as the employability of skills of UK engineering degree students, while also strengthening these external partnerships with industry. My professorship is covering two areas. First of all, and this, this falls into the first part, lectures and interactive workshops and discussions on key industrial and regulatory challenges and opportunities for uh, material scientists and engineers. And that includes a curriculum review that I've done at Manchester. And secondly, career support, one-to-one -one CV coaching. Um, so uh, I, I've done that with a number of undergraduates and postgraduate students uh, focusing on transferable skills. Um, I'm 
just going to move on now to why this workshop's taking place. Uh, one of the themes um, that I talk about with the undergraduates and postgraduates at some of the Royce um, uh, student summits is technical expertise is needed in policy making. So this workshop is about a little bit about how to influence in a very political environment because this can affect businesses, the economy, employment and so on. And what this is part of a theme about you need to have very clear, concise, prioritised technical communication. Um, it's uh, also an yet another way to raise the profile of the department here at Manchester and the Royce. And uh, Phil, the chief scientist, will be aware that obviously Grant Shapps visited um, a few weeks ago. So we are very much getting on the per, uh, political radar. It's also about the need to represent a community, a network community of materials academics in the UK through the Royce, but also as a department. And this workshop, uh, when Sarah Cartmel and I started scoping out this, we thought, um, actually, we think this is primarily for academics, but we are also for postgraduate researchers. I know some of my second year undergraduates have said, can I come along too? Of course you can. Um, so there may well be some undergraduates in the audience too. Um, I've been a witness um, in person in front of seven uh, parliamentary select and bill committees representing some effectively materials manufacturers um, in the ceramic sector. So in a different a variety of things, and I'm going to call on some of these examples today. Um, this is in addition to providing quite a lot of written evidence as well. So my first one was in the Great Recession on economics, where the committee came to the West Midlands. Um, um, a couple for the Environmental Audit Committee, and this was around decarbonisation. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the Bayes Committee on gas storage. And then the last three were, uh, was a bill and then two trade select committees on primarily on what's called trade remedies. This is some, some legislation we needed to put in place post Brexit for when others aren't playing by the rules there. But there was legislation in the EU, but not in the UK. Um, so moving on to, um, I, I just want to emphasize, and this is very much with the Royce policy hat on, select committees are only part of the legislation process. There are other ways to influence that are much, maybe much more appropriate. So you could also, as academics or researchers, consider doing consultation responses. If you're, you know your local MP, you might want to get them to ask parliamentary questions. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was an Institute for Government and Policy at Manchester workshop so this is very much building on this this is just one small tool in the armory but it's trying to teach those broader messages about clear communication too um, there's some useful links and we're going to send out the slide pack to um, people with a, an ac um, email address afterwards um, so the Parliament has got some useful information for researchers and there's a range of training courses on how to engage with Parliament and so on. And uh, we've got Judith and Luke here uh, from the Royce, but contact um, through that email address directly if you'd like inf additional information about these possibilities. So first of all, what is a select committee. I'm going to show you now, assuming the technology works, a short video from Parliament. It just lasts a couple of minutes or so, because they can explain it much better than me. Now, there is a select committee. So. Is that working? What are select committees? Can we move that to the other screen? Committees set up to examine the work of every government department. There are also committees this that look at topics like science and technology or how the government spends I'm its just money. Going to play the so there's audio, a committee for every possible um, political interest. You might find a committee looking into prison safety or clean energy, transport problems or international trade. If you find a committee is looking into something you've experienced firsthand, we might well want to hear from you. 
We want to know how the government's policies are working in the real world. And we want to know what needs to change to make things better. When committees start their inquiries, we call out for views and comments from the public before we ask people to come to Parliament to speak to us in open sessions. These can be scientists, charity workers, economists, senior officials, business chiefs or government ministers. They might be people who've got personal experience of using public services like job centres, schools and hospitals. They've got one thing in common. There's lots we can learn from them to help us in our work. And we don't just stay in London. If we need to travel to find out more, then we will. Then the members of the committee, who are all MPs, sit down and write their report. Each report makes recommendations to the government to change things for the better. And the government must publicly respond to each and every one. Each committee has a chair whose job it is to coordinate the views of the other members of their committee. These MPs represent the spread of parties in Parliament itself. So each committee has MPs from different places in the UK and with different political opinions working together. Find us all now at committees.parliament.uk. Take a look and see if we are investigating something that is close to your heart. Okay, um, when we send out the slides, um, you will be able to click on that link and watch that as well. But six select committee moments that grabbed oh, the headlines. Started just playing Number one, way. in February 2016. Right, okay. Um, so the stages that a select committee will go through, it's very much a multi-party uh, committee, is, is first of all, they need to make a decision to run an inquiry. In, they can be influenced on how to do that. Then they gather evidence, both written and in person. Then they write a report, and then the government has to provide a response. The government might not actually choose to act on it, but they have to provide a written response. So the committee chair has to act in quite a neutral way, and their different committees have different uh, chairs from different parties. Um, the members represent very different political parties and there's the clerk who is a civil servant and is actually a key person and um, if you're doing quite a lot with select committees like I was doing with the trade committee I used to meet with the clerk on a, an occasional basis as well um, so uh, how can I best engage as the expert so I think uh, what we're going to look at are what are the relevant committees and inquiries? How do you find out what's going on in your research area? Then, is it a priority? Why am I doing this? What's my aim here? What's a likely result? What's a personal benefit? And I know academics haven't necessarily been... Um, this doesn't normally feature your reward system, uh, but it is actually quite a significant thing that you're, you're doing. And then how to engage. And there are different ways of engaging through written evidence, oral evidence, visits. And this is why I mentioned Grant Chaps as visit. And then informal briefings or update with the clerk or the chair or their assistant. So this is about saying, actually, there's a strategic thinking and influencing piece going on here. And I'm going to use those questions as we go forward um, to explain about how I've approached this in the past. So um, to identify possible committees and set up email alerts, um, I put some links in. I put in some of the common select committees that work in areas where materials uh, scientists and engineers do work. For example, at the moment, I had a look last night, the Bayes Committee, um, has done a report on the semiconductor industry in the UK. They're waiting a government response. Um, they're also doing a report on decarbonisation of the power sector. So that might be relevant to some of you. In DEFRA, they've, uh, on that, that select committee, they've just published a report on plastic waste, which I know the Department at Manchester has got some really strong research into. The Environmental Audit Select Committee has got an open 
uh, investigation on technological innovations and climate change, focusing on onshore solar uh, energy. So that must be something that I'm sure someone somewhere around the Royce community is researching into. Um, they're also doing work on sustainable timber and deforestation and also on green steel. I think that one's still open. So it just gives you an idea about the sort of things just going on at the moment in this space. Um, so uh, how best can I engage as an, experiment, uh, as an expert? I'm going to start with written evidence. This is much simpler. If you are going to do this, there are committees in the Commons, and that's where I focus, but also there may be something going on in the Lords and the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. They all have slightly different guidance and formats. I'm going to concentrate, but similar principles apply. I'm going to concentrate on the Commons today. So key thing is you, you need to think about how you're positioning this. Are you going to collaborate with other groups? If I just give an example, so suppose there were an inquiry going on on hydrogen. Um, the Royce has got a report on materials for hyd and hydrogen and what is the Royce's approach. So it may be an academic at, say, Imperial um, and an academic at Manchester might choose to put in separate evidence, but also the Royce might choose to put in an overarching view. Because sometimes if you're reinforcing that, that can be a very strong message to the committee that this is something strategic, organised and important. And they're not, they're not getting that much evidence from academics. So if there's a strategic approach, that could be quite powerful. Keep the evidence brief and focused. You're going to see an example in a moment about what brief and focus can really look like. Uh, you're, you're stuck to 3,000 words anyway, um, but you don't need to use all of those. Um, Postgraduates, I would say, and postdocs, I think you should, really should check with your supervisor when I was talking this through with some of the professors uh, beforehand and senior staff. Don't just do this off your own back. It's, it's got to be part of a broader strategic approach and context and have a sense check with someone else. And written evidence can be quite quick, half a day's work to several days' work. So I'm going to give an example now and explain the context of this. When I was running the British Ceramic Confederation, there had just been the 2015 election and new, new select committees were set up. And the Energy and Climate Change Committee, as it was called then, that this is now part of the Bayes Committee, has a new chair, Angus McNeil, who was the SNP, who we didn't really know. And of course, all these new members of the committee and um, ceramics, energy intensive industry. Um, and so this is the process I went through. Is it a priority? Yes. Energy security, uh, and that the committee wanted to know what are our priorities for this parliament? It's a perfectly reasonable thing to ask. So we said, energy security, decarbonisation and cost is a priority for all our member companies. So why am I doing this? It's about establishing a link with the new committee and chair. What's my aim? Just get these high priorities on the record. What's a, a likely result? I, we were members of the energy intensive users groups, so other sectors like steel and chemicals and paper and glass. So if they're reinforcing these priorities, we may actually have some success and a useful programme of work. So I was prepared to spend up to half a day's work on this. I wasn't planning on giving oral evidence, but if they wanted me to do so, I would do, would do that. So that's what it looks like. You can click on the link to read it a bit more. So a short paragraph explaining who the British Ceramic Confederation is. The committee were just asking two questions. What Department of Energy of Climate Change policy areas do you think require particular scrutiny? And the second one was, what should the committee's scrutiny pr uh, priorities be over the next 12 months? So the three short things, security of, of energy supplies, things haven't changed, have they? Industrial decarbonisation and market-based energy and climate policy. 
and then what the immediate priorities were the cumulative cost of UK and EU climate policies and the fifth carbon budget. How do you achieve that at least cost? So as you can see, that's something you can write in half a day, the sort of thing you can write in half a day. It didn't, um, so that's something where probably most postgraduates could have a pretty good go at drafting something like that in their policy area. It doesn't need to be, um, and this is what I mean by less is more. Okay. Um, So, uh, so that was just the link to the written evidence. Now, a bit more complicated written evidence. This is now in summer 2020. COVID's raging. There's now a different parliament. There's an international trade committee. And lo and behold, this Angus McNeil has popped up as the chair of the international trade committee. Uh, I've given um, evidence to a couple of his committees. He knows who I am. Um, his assistant and I ha perhaps have a chat on the phone every few months, or if I'm in London, we might have a cup of tea. I know who the clerk is. They know that ceramics do influence quite a lot on trade. So my thinking here was, yes, it is a priority. They're asking loads and loads and loads of questions. Why am I doing this? It's about maintaining that relationship. And then what's my aim? It's getting the high level priorities on the record because there was lots of, jo uh, we need a joined up government response. Um, we need some more support for domestic manufacturing. And we haven't got a trade deal with the EU at the, the moment. Um, so we need to get some of the issues relating to that and there were some discussions with the World Trade Organization taking place, which we had some, um, we had some issues that needed to be raised in them. So what's a likely result? I wasn't expect, uh, so it was about trying to amplify other sectors messaging. And um, it just gave the committee some questions because the select, uh, Secretary of State has to appear in front of the select committee on a pretty regular basis. So next time, uh, in that case, it was a she, because they've just changed several times since then. Uh, next time she was up in front of them, it would give them some, some ideas for questions to ask her. Um, and then the written evidence. This really was a couple of days of work. Um, I, I'd said at the bottom as well, I'm willing to give that oral evidence, but um, it it's re was really, for me, it was about just maintaining that relationship and maintaining the communication with the key people. Now, I, I really... Okay, so let's move on to oral evidence now. Um, and for this one, you may actually have to be a bit proactive thinking about uh, is an inquiry taking place or how might I persuade an inquiry to take place? Uh, there's slightly different um, guidelines for witnesses appearing in front of an oral committee. Now, a key thing here is preparing for the questions. And I've spoken to a couple of academics who've given evidence, and they're saying, oh, um, we weren't quite sure what we were going to get. Um, uh, the clerk may have sent us through some questions. So what I always did, because the, you never know what, what questions you're going to get on the day, um, I, you can ask for a phone call with the clerk or a Zoom meeting, and um, just write down every single word that they say, and they will give you some questions. Um, you may choose to work in a team with who are the other witnesses, because when the professor said, I wasn't quite sure who was going to be a witness with me, yeah, it will be on the Parliament website. Um, and think about which MPs, what's their agenda, um, I'm going to talk you through my filing system in a moment. And then um, after you've given evidence, again, this is a useful trick and tip, is you can give some supplementary written evidence. They will send you the transcript immediately afterwards, and this will be auto-recorded. And you really do have to check through it very, very carefully because a comma in the wrong place or they may have misheard an an or in or something and 
uh, recorded the opposite of what you wanted to say. You can't add new stuff to it apart from in written evidence, but you can correct something if they've misheard you. Um, and then media attention, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, if you're appearing in front of a select committee, you may get some media approaches. I know Luke's been taking some calls from the BBC today. Um, you're very much on uh, uh, following uh, Grant Shapps' visit. You've, you've got quite a high media profile now. Um, so this, again, I would say this is several days' work in addition to written evidence. So this is just a typical folder that I pulled together. Um, there was an index in it and uh, space for notes. The questions uh, were, uh, I typed out here and then wrote down my key answers on what were absolutely the key points I had to get across. And I had just had some of the evidence to hand. Now, this is quite verbose. I was working, we were briefed along with two other witnesses. Uh, this is a trade remedies one. So uh, the head of international trade at the TUC, Rosa Crawford, and also a consultant to an alliance that I chaired across a number of trade associations and unions. We're all briefed together and we divvied up following that who was going to say what. So we're thinking quite strategically about that. And then that's the supplementary evidence. I set written evidence I sent in afterwards. Um, you, can't, you don't have to go into all the detail. You can say, I don't have those details to hand. I will send them through to you afterwards. Pictures of who's on the select committee. And I did a, a sort of with a, um, which constituency, which party. And nothing interesting going on in their constituency as well. Like in this case, we're, a number, we're concerned about the numbers of manufacturing jobs. So which ones are therefore going to be more likely to ask questions. And my register ticks and crosses for who's there. Not all of them turn up on the day. Uh, just the actual inquiry. Um, some written evidence that we put in and um, also some briefings from our consultant about what has happened when the, uh, a minister was interviewed the previous week by the committee um, and some written evidence from an early inquiry which we may need to refer to. A couple of up-to-date Economist articles because Mr Trump was doing some interesting stuff on trade at that point. And um, so it gives you a flavour. You just need to be prepared if you're going down to Parliament to uh, give evidence. Um, so the next one, because it's cold outside and we're a bit worried about energy, security and cost. I thought it might be helpful to talk about um, a gas security inquiry. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember back to the 1st of March uh, 2018. There was something called um, a gas deficit warning. The country almost ran out of gas and it was freezing outside. I had to go down to London for a, a fancy dinner that evening. I was wearing a, a pretty, pretty dress at the time. And uh, as I was travelling down, I got a call. Could you go on Newsnight, please, and talk about gas security, representing an alliance of different manufacturers and trade unions who wanted more gas storage? So... I've done that in March and our lines was pressing for government to do an urgent inquiry into gas security. Nothing very much changes, does it? Um, and so later on in the year, the Bay Select Committee and then Rachel Reeves was, who's now the Shadow Chancellor, was chairing that. Um, we, she decided to run an inquiry on gas storage. So it's part of an alliance and moreover, rough gas storage had just closed and uh, officials kept on saying, oh, the market will deliver gas, but at what cost industry was thinking. So what was my aim here is to get government to change their mind or review at the very least what's going on. It's also about putting some of my, our concerns on the record very, very precisely and get some media coverage, if possible, and focus on the key messages. So what's a likely result? Um, we might get some amplification of our messaging. There could be some more questions to the Secretary of State. There's possible longer-term change, but government hasn't done it. Actually, 
Ruff, a small part of Ruff has now reopened, so there's a little bit more gas storage, but we still only got 2% of what we actually, of our annual use is gas storage. And gas, um, uh, well, most material, much materials manufacture um, has got something energy intensive in its supply chain somewhere. So this is actually quite important to the materials community. Um, the written evidence had taken many days' work by the consultant we were using across our alliance um, and then had resulted in this oral evidence. And they said, Laura, it's you doing it right. So um, what did I do? I prepared for the questions and there was a, a clerk briefing. We work very much as a team and um, other witnesses. There were three other witnesses with me. I think one or two were possibly friendly, but uh, most were not. And there was a batch of officials being interviewed by the select committee immediately afterwards who were very, we knew were very unhelpful on this issue. Um, so which MPs, what was their agenda? I'd met Rachel um, a number of times previously. She'd visited a ceramic plant and um, I'd hosted a round table with a number of our members and her a few years previously. So she knew us reasonably well. And also several other MPs on that committee. Uh, we knew that some, uh, a couple of large chemical companies uh, didn't necessarily want larger UK gas storage for various reasons. Um, and we thought that might potentially be a bit of a problem in that inquiry um, as well. So we were sort of anticipating what to do. Um, on the media attention before and afterwards, um, we did a press release. I was called on to the Today programme at 6.15 that morning in the business slot. That was my first time on the Today programme. And I knew there was going to be quite a bit of specialist energy media watching. So it's quite a bit of preparation and work. So um, I had all my questions prepared. There was 85 minutes because it was supposed to start at 10 o'clock. It started at five past. If you're actually a witness in one of the... You're in a sort of horseshoe, uh, if you've ever seen Parliament TV. Um, there's a, the chap on my right and my left were two of the other witnesses. Uh, you're facing the MPs, and behind you are members of the public and journalists. So there were some energy journalists sitting beside me. And you, we had an, uh, an hour and a half, 85 minutes, but there are votes going on in Parliament. You're f suddenly fine. The division bell starts ringing. All the MPs disappear for 10 minutes to vote. Then they'll come back, and that can happen several times. So if there are four of you, and the MPs are also talking too, you've got to be really precise and concise and focused on what you want to get over. And you may have an idea from the, from the what's that, from the um, clerk about what is um, going to be the first question. And this is why I'd like to play this, if at all possible. Um, so I, have, I, I, I knew what I was going to say first, and then something different happened. I'm just going to click on this, and at least you can hear what happened. Because... Order, order. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence to our select committee this morning on the important issue of gas storage. We've got two panels uh, this morning, so uh, we'll start off uh, straight away. And the first uh, question is from Albert Owen. Good morning. Um, what was the impact of the Beast of the East and associated gas alerts on household industry gas and electricity bills? Should we start with you, Laura? Those of us that were up at 6 o'clock probably had a a taster of what you're going to say? <laughs> so I had to rethink Thank what I was you. going to say, well, but it's um, an opportunity to talk. You can see the setup of the room. On the verge of suffering cutbacks in essential supplies, and some electricity generators were ca uh, curtailed, and both wholesale gas and electricity prices rose to 
record levels, the system average price. I'm not going to play it, it on, but you've just got to get your key um, points across and recognise that this is your opportunity. Um, I did ha have a chance to speak later on, but I just needed to get the key points on the record the at this point. Weather lasted a few days longer because industrial demand picks up so, on Mondays. And, of course, if the wind hadn't been blowing, and, of course, in 2025, we're not going to have the so, uh, coal fired generation on this. there. And gas supplies to residential customers are protected so, under the okay. current gas security standard, so, but industry and gas power generators are first in line and just can't hedge against the supply disruption, which impacts directly on output, international competitiveness and employment. So um, some of our members were thinking, well, you know, if we no. suddenly have to shut down the brickworks. We really don't want our, to play the whole of that know, select the, committee. We could normally um, do a planned shutdown plan right. several months uh, in advance. Uh, um, the, the price peak, the, those are um, one, one day, but the price Right. So you get the idea about what you're having to say and how you're having to say it. And so we're just going to go back now to the main presentation. Um, from current, sorry. Um, one other uh, thing that I would say is how can I best gauge as an expert? Very few people actually do this, is visits and briefings. So you can always, if you know the chair or have met the clerk, you could provide a succinct briefing on something. Um, I've got an example on the left-hand side here of a select committee visit. This was the Brexit select committee. And um, we've got Hilary Benn, he's third from the left, who was chairing that. And he came to visit Johnson Tiles with some members of his committee. And then he had a round table with, um, with a number of uh, managing directors from the ceramic industry. And this was in private. Um, we allowed media in for 15 minutes afterwards to question Hillary Benn, which th that they want to do, but you may choose not to do that. They had 20 minutes of his undivided time, so that was quite useful. And these things are like buses. They, you wait ages for one, and then um, several come along. But actually, on the same day, the bottom right picture... I was in London because I, at the time I was chair of the Energy Intensive Users Group. And at the head of the table is Ian Wright, who was chair of the Bay Select Committee. So he'd asked to speak to EIUG, so trade associations and uh, companies from some of these sectors about a range of energy issues. So I, I needed to be at that. So I was quite comfortable delegating um, the, Bay, uh, the Brexit Select Committee one. So this is the sort of thing that perhaps the Royce might want to do is think about are there some key select committees uh, working in areas that are important to the department as well. And it, it is very manageable for academics, I think, as well. So, um, but beware. Oh, hang on. Um, sorry. Uh, Technology is defeating me here. Um, okay. Let's see that one and then. Okay. Uh, you can influence the select committee even when you're not there. And how many of you came to my inaugural lecture? I, I know Phil did. Yeah, several, several of you did. And um, the background to this was one of the case studies um, on, uh, it was on tariffs and actually, you know, do you take a stand when something um, is, uh, do, you, do you put stick your head above the parapet? And in that case, I needed to, to represent my members. Um, this was leading up to Brexit. 
um, a, a potential no-deal Brexit uh, was due at the end of March 2019. And uh, the then Secretary of State, in a meeting with me and uh, some manufacturers, um, the previous week had said he was going to unilaterally reduce to zero all import tariffs in the event of a no-deal Brexit. And he was going to lay the uh, legislation a few days later. So no consultation, no parliamentary scrutiny. This is something quite major about the economy, which we would have affected lots and lots of different manufacturers. And the farmers knew about it, and they'd gone public. But CBI, British Chambers of Commerce, Make UK didn't know about it, and it has very, very major implications. So I've given some, some written evidence sort of like the day after my meeting to Fox, he deranged a subsequent meeting. He wouldn't back down. This was really serious. Our members were pretty scared about this. Um, and um, I was asked to go on the Today program. And this is the time uh, Judith, uh, I mentioned to Judith, I was interviewed by John Humphreys in a prime political Scot slot. So that was pretty scary. And then I went back into the office and uh, just working away on my computer, when my colleague said, oh, Trade Select Committee is on Fox is being interviewed. I am going to press the play here because this is what happened. And who's the chief executive of the British Ceramics Confederation, who talks about this being a completely foolhardy step, uh, wrecking the home market for the ceramic sector. You understand her concern you mentioned uh, a while ago. That would be, again... So it's basically, um, what do you say to Laura Cohen? Um, so hopefully, is that back on screen now? Oh, goodness. So, um, again, you can have a look at the links in... Sorry. Some, some of this... Um, but um, I, I was, at that moment, I had to leave my desk because uh, Sky News arrived. I had to go onto site, do an interview. And in the piece that evening we act, that Sky News had, and they put on their website, so you can see that, there was actually a second select committee chair in Bayes interviewing the Secretary of State for Bayes, who was actually quite supportive of what, where we were. So the cabinet were, it hadn't been discussed with, cab, with lots of cabinet members. Um, some of them didn't appreciate this being pushed through quite quickly so um it it just shows that sometimes the uh the certainly mps listen to the today program i think is the conclusion for that so um i think that just takes me on to no i was going to say this is um the last slide here um, so I think this is really over to you for any questions, because I've been talking for far too long. Um, does anyone have any thoughts or questions here? How much are you volunteering your opinion? How much are you being invited to, um, to put a, an opinion forward? Because obviously you're in your position, that's the sort of thing that the select committee might or the clerk might reach out to, you know, these sort of large consortia. If you're not that and you want to just get your your opinion put forward, how easy or not? Right. Um, the, for those of you who are online, I'm just going to repeat that. How much of it is sort of proactive and reactive about putting your opinions forward? Um, and this is particularly important if you've not done this before and you're getting started. I think if you're getting started, just put in some written evidence first so that you're getting on their, their radar. I think in most situations, um, Environmental Audit Committee, um, it was a local MP who was chairing the committee and she was very keen to get me to appear in front of it. So that, that was one occasion. The Rachel Reeves one, we did have to push quite hard to get an inquiry formed, uh, uh, produced on some of the some of the initial trade ones. I was um, just invited. I hadn't didn't have to do anything. 
or two of them, um, they approached me as well because I, they, they could see who I, what I was doing and saying. But I would say, if, you're, if you've not done this before, you may just need to get on their radar by putting in some written evidence. If you know an MP on that committee, you may want um, to have a chat with them as well. Um, any more questions? Do, does that help? Yeah. yeah. Uh, at the back. Um, first of all, first time I went through this like at all, not the worst. Okay, <laughs> thank you. That's reassuring. <laughs> Yes. So, what is the difference between what the elected county tries to do and what the board? I've talked to a couple of people and they said, well, most of the sciences work for it and not the board. Okay. As a scientist, if we want to influence things, we go to the board. Um, you might go to the Lords more, and that's why I've put the video in about what happens with the Lords and how their process works as well. I've not personally given evidence to a Lords committee. They're perhaps trying to take a bit more of a, a broader strategic long-term view, I think. Okay. Brian. Yeah. Um, the procedure you're going to, you, you to talk about reminds me of the times I've been an expert witness. Exactly. In court cases. Yes. And the thing that concerns me is that when you're an expert witness in a court case, there is a whole team of solicitors and possibly even a barrister and a junior who are sort of helping you because they know the whole procedure as to how these things are done. Because giving evidence to a court of law, I imagine, is rather similar to giving, similar but different to giving evidence to a select committee. There's a certain language you need to be aware of. Um, the sort of the points you're getting across are to people who are intelligent uh, but know nothing at all about what you're, you're expert in. And when you were at the Islamic Federation, I know it's a fairly small operation, you still had a team to assist you in that, to do research. So, so it does sound like a, a lot of work uh, to get it across correctly. And so for the individual, I can see how if you were part of, if the, the faculty or Royce as a T, Royce said, what would be the Royce opinion, you're the person who can help you with it. To see how that was supported there, but for an individual, it, it looks it looks like a lot of pitfall because you can you can make mistakes as as, as to what you should be. Yeah, uh, for those of you who are online, and um, I'm not sure how the Zoom thing is working, we may want to pick up some Zoom questions next in a moment. Um, Brian's asked, this seems like an expert witness. Uh, he's been an expert witness. There are lots of pitfalls. Yes, um, I, I, I think um, I, I would say, uh, do you have a team supporting you? And at the British Ceramic Confederation, there were just 10 of us. And I, there would at most be one person for each of these who had some policy background in that area to assist me. Um, but at the end of the day, you are doing that presentation. That colleague may or may not be in the audience behind you. I've never actually had that, but I've never actually had that support. But um, there may be chums as well who can, uh, you know, other other people who are going to be on the next uh, committee panel who may be able to pass you a note or something like that. If you see how the civil servants and the ministers do it, there's quite often uh, a secretary of state or a minister will have a special advisor passing them a note beforehand. That's why I take the file with me. That's why I write down very, very precisely what I'm going to say. And I may come across as a bit, may have come across as a bit wooden in those committees but I know that I want to get on the record something very precisely. I wish I had the fluency um, to be able to do it ad lib, but I think there's just too much at stake. It does get a bit easier with practice as well. So, but I think also treat this workshop as um, it's an opportunity to just understand a bit more how to influence the political process today 
and um, get involved and or it can be an alternative tactic in parallel with things like consultation responses and so on, which I guess academics perhaps do a bit more often or might brief their MP or a minister. Okay. And uh, is there, are there any questions online? Okay. Um, I'm just conscious of 5 to 11. I would just welcome a little bit of feedback. Uh, has this been useful today? Oh, yeah, well, so, some thumbs up there. Okay. Um, what committees are, well, first of all, I would just say as an action, if there's some committees that are relevant for your work, if you do nothing else, just click on the Parliament Select Committee website and just see what's going on there and uh, perhaps just uh, keep an eye on what they're doing. Um, we thought when we were setting this up, we, um, there might be... How many of you are interested in finding out a little bit more about this, or has this just given you enough of a flavour? Okay. I think if you uh, are, then um, do just send me an email if you'd like a chat. That's probably the easiest way um, that we can just take things forward. Well, thank you very much for your attention. And um, I know this is something a little bit different, but Sarah and Phil and I were keen to put this in as part of my visiting professorship. Thank you. And a big thank you to those online too. And I spotted at least one student who'd attended the Royce Student Summit Policy Workshop. So thank you.